So I look forward to entertaining your questions. And again, there's no question off limits. There's no question out of bounds. And the more personal you make it, I think the, the, the better it is for all of us. So with that, who has a question they'd like to ask about anything that, you can, that you'd like to know about? And if you could do me a favor, if you could say your name as well as if you're an admitted student or if you are a current student and, and what year you would be. So please, who has a question? This is always very dramatic because you always ask for questions and you have no clue if anyone raises their hand <laughs> or has any. So it always has this like, it always has this like incredible high drama that kind of like, you know, that kind of like comes with it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah, somebody had to break the ice. Yeah, uh, indeed. How, how do you think you're going to get along with the other justices who are your, your brethren on the, uh, on the Michigan Supreme Court? Oh, I, you know what? I really like the other justices. It's a wonderful court. And, and I want to tell you, people really like each other. People really enjoy each other. And people really, it's, it's, it's a really great place to work. I have to say, you know, there might be some differences of opinions, but people really like each other. It is a really great place to work, and it is an incredibly great place to be a part of. I, mean, I would have to say that there is a level of camaraderie and collegiality that exists on the court that I truly, truly enjoy. So whether you might have a situation where people might sometimes disagree as to you know, their interpretation of the law. That's why you have seven people. But what I would tell you is, is, is that the conversation is wonderful. The conversation is robust. And most importantly, justices really like each other. You know, they really like each other. And, and there's a genuine friendship that exists between all the justices. And people really care about each other. They really connect with each other. And they feel a personal camaraderie you know, to the other justices. And I think that really goes a long way. And the thing I can tell you that I've enjoyed is the fact that people listen to each other. When we get involved in discussions over cases, people really want to hear what everyone has to say. People are really committed to engaging in the conversation. And people are genuinely focused on what it is you have to say. They want to learn about it. They want to understand. They want to appreciate you know, what your position is. And it's wonderful because it really is a very open environment of discussion and conversation. And what's great is that when you go into conferences, you know, no one's mind is already made up. People want to hear what everyone has to say. And if you have an argument you want to make on a case, people are really open and inclined to hearing it. So it's a, it's a really good court. It's a really, really good place to work. It is a really supportive environment. And, and I have to tell you, with my experience, I really, really enjoy very much the people I get to work with. Other questions? One more? Yes, thank you so much. For yes. Yes. <laughs> so the way that a the way that a blind person runs is you run on a tether, and what happens is that you have a guide, and the guide gives you directional cues: hard right, soft right, hard left, soft left, and you follow those directional cues. And so what happens is as you're running, you're listening very closely to what your guide is saying. But it really creates a wonderful team environment. Like the team environment is fantastic. It's a wonderful, wonderful team. It's a wonderful environment. And I, and I really enjoy that. And it's just, it's one of those things where basically it, it builds team skills. It builds camaraderie. And the blessing about running with a guide is, is that you're basically putting your life in someone else's hands. So it allows for you to establish a true and genuine sense of what trust is and what trust is about and what trust represents and what trust means. Now, of course, the Ironman is a little bit more challenging because you're underwater and then you're on a bike and then you're running and you're doing all those kinds of things. But it's all about team. It's all about working on a team. and It's all about being a part of a team. And it's all about that team approach that exists with everything that we do. And I think athletics is really analogous to law school and the practice of law which is you have to be able to work as a team and work well with others. 
Other questions? Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a great question. And it's, it's a really good question. You know, why leave? I loved what I was doing as, a, you know, as, as an advocate. I loved that. Like that was a, I used to wake up every day and I was able to take on fights and battles and challenges that you know, really meant something to people and could make a difference to people. The reason that I did it was because I believe that in order to be a good judge, there are three elements that have to go into it. There is, of course, the application of the facts to the law. But in addition to the facts to the law, I think that personal experience is absolutely critical. Personal experience matters, and it matters greatly as it pertains to how decisions are rendered and ultimately determined. If you have seven people in a room that are making decisions on matters that affect all of us, you want that life experience. If you have people in a room that don't have a variety of life experience, that don't have a degree of life experience, if you have people that come at it from the same perspective, I think that voices get left out. So I ran for this position because I knew that with my own life experience as a blind person, as a disabled person, as a challenged person, I knew that this could be important because ultimately it allows people to look at things or understand things or appreciate things in a way that is different. In a way that is different from how they might see it. And it's great because you know when you have a blind person sitting in a room, there's a beauty to that. Because what happens is, is that you run your meetings differently, you have to work together differently, you have to approach things differently. And what that does is it's wonderful. It allows for people to see things in a different light or a different way. Just by simply being physically present, you know, just by sometimes being physically there, people have a chance to grow and learn together. You know, when they're in the building and they see you walk into the wall or walk into a door or that you can't use the elevator because you can't use your security key, what's nice about that is just by sometimes being there, it allows for others to see the challenges that you go through that they aren't exposed to or that they haven't had that opportunity to learn about and appreciate. So I think the beauty of it is the fact that disability brings a perspective. And I think with that perspective, through conversations, through discourse, but through friendship and camaraderie, can allow for people to look, experience, and envision things in a different way. Other questions, please. I have a question. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, what made you go into disability law, like advocating on behalf of others? And what was like the one personal experience that made you say, this is it, this is it for me? Mm -hmm. Well, going through law school for me was excruciatingly difficult. I had to memorize and internalize everything when I was in law school. So I want you guys to envision it like. You know, as you know, a contracts exam or a civil procedure exam or a property exam, you're going to have a 10 to 15 page fact pattern. So I would memorize and internalize that fact pattern before I could answer the question. I'd have the fact pattern read to me 15 to 20 times and I would memorize every word of it. And then I would dictate the answer to a scribe only after having memorized a 15, 20 page fact pattern. Now the bar was even more difficult because the bar, you'd have a question, the essays were relatively straightforward. I had no issue with those because I, so I did in law school. But if you had a question on the bar that said one page fact pattern, statements one, two, three, four, and five, A was one, two, and three, B was two, four, and five, C was two and five, D was one, two, and three. <laughs> you'd have to memorize the entire you know, fact pattern. Then statements one through five, 
then A, B, C, D, E, and F. All that had to be memorized. Oh, thank you. So I think the answer to your question was that this was such a difficult struggle, but I wanted it so badly. You know, it was so difficult, but I wanted it so badly. And I wanted it so much that what happened was, as I was going through it, you know, I'm a very spiritual person. I prayed to the heavens, I prayed to God, and I said, look, if you give me the opportunity to graduate from law school and pass the bar, in answer to your question, I will dedicate myself to representing people with disabilities and special needs who otherwise don't have access to legal representation. And so I came back to Detroit after passing the Michigan bar. And a promise is a promise. Your word is your word. And we established our public services division. And what our public services division did was it represented people completely for free, without charge. And we took on cases that involved people with disabilities who otherwise had no other vehicle or any place to go. And we took the cases that were the most expensive that were the most challenging, that were the most complicated. We took the cases that nobody else would take because we believed in it. I knew we had to do it. It was a just cause and a noble thing to do, and it's what the law allows for you to do. People would ask, you know, why didn't you fee shift? You have a right to fee shift in ADA, and I would never fee shift. And the reason was, I would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, and my firm would on each case. The costs were tremendous. Time was unbelievable, but I would never fee shift because I never wanted people to think that disability rights was not a civil right. Disability rights is a civil right. And I never wanted people to think that it was about money. I never wanted people to think that the reason we were fighting with the University of Michigan or Delta Airlines or the Detroit Department of Transportation was about money. I wanted them to understand what it meant and what it represented to the people that we were fighting for, for the services that we wanted to get, for the impact that we wanted to have, for the effect that we wanted to have. That's what the law is about. That's what the law gave me the chance to do. Now, the reason I work so hard and the reason that I spend 15 hours a day working and never stopping and do it seven days is because I believe that I was blessed with a really great gift. There are usually two situations that people can find themselves in life. This is a complete oversimplification, but I believe that this does tend to happen. You can have situation A, where a person goes through life and they know hardship and challenge and tragedy and struggle and difficulty and discrimination. You can have person B, who goes through life, who doesn't know these hardships or challenges or difficulties. Gets to live a life that's a little easier, a little bit more of privilege, and has been divorced from those kind of difficulties, those kind of hardships, those, that kind of pain or, or, or challenge. But the reason I work hard and the reason I became an attorney was because I determined that I could do both. That I was able to understand and appreciate challenge and difficulty through my disability. But then, because of the family I was born into and the resources that we had, I was able to actually do something about it. So you could experience injustice and discrimination and challenge and pain, but then you had the ability to do something. You had the resources to do something. You had the opportunity to do something. That's why I became an attorney. And that's how we did the work that we did, was because we had the experiences, but at the same time, I also had the ability through resources to stand up and do something that could enhance or make a difference in the lives of people. Other questions, please. Hi, my name yes. is Melissa Dilfers. I am in my third year here okay. at Uh huh. Mm. and disabled, especially individually disabled. 
Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could then express more where you think the legal profession is going and becoming more accessible to disabled people. Well, I think that's a great question. I think that, um, you know, I think that's a wonderful thing. I think technology is the great equalizer. Technology is a wonderful equalizer. Technology can allow for great things to happen. And I think that if you just continue doing what you're doing, if you, you know, most people have technology they can read to them, or they have readers that can read to them. And I think that what's great is these kind of publications and these kind of, of memoranda and these kinds of things are becoming more accessible. Technology has created a world that is different from the world that we knew when I was first born. There is no, no limitations. We can do anything and experience anything. We can rise to anything. We can approach anything. We can do anything. There are experiences and things that we can encounter and we can do that can be life-changing and that can be impactful. And ultimately, through those publications and through that accessibility, you're allowing more people to enter that circle and be a part of what you are doing. Other questions, please. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Oh, it's a great question. That's a wonderful, wonderful question. You know, I really think that as I, you know, at the end of the day, what you always have to come back to is people. This is all about people. The law has to make sense. There are two things about the law that I think are critical. Number one, you always have to think about people and the impact and the effect on people. And number two, the law is not as complicated as we make it out to be. There is a fundamental appreciation and awareness and understanding of fairness. You can overcomplicate it and you can write about it and you can do all these things with it. But at the end of the day, there is without question a fundamental notion of fairness. People know what is just and people know what is right in just about all cases. And if you attempt to be guided by what is fair, if you attempt to be guided by what is just, and if you attempt to be guided by what is right, you can usually see your way through. I think from a spiritual context and from a spiritual sense, no matter what religion you subscribe to, I think the way that you can appreciate it and understand it is if you look at it based off of mission. If I were to go through life as a blind person who was then struck down by a cyclist after learning to run and be athletic and who found athletics as a great joy and a most beautiful thing, and then to be struck down and have to live in chronic pain, if I was to go through life and just simply say, this is incredibly unfair, this is incredibly unjust. This is just simply not right. It would be a very difficult and painful life to live. It would be a very embittered life to live. But whether it's true or not, if you're able to think and believe that you are part of something bigger, if you are part of something grander, if you are part of something more noble, if you are part of a plan that you don't know, that you can't grasp, but if you just simply believe that things do happen for a reason, and again, that's an entirely different discussion, but if you believe it, and yes, it, it, it can't be proven at all times, but if you just believe that there was a reason why this occurred or why this happened, it allows for your life to be so much more fulfilling. It allows for your life to be so much more meaningful. It allows for your life to be so much more impassioned. Other questions? I'm, I'm enjoying this. This is a wonderful experience. I love being with you guys. And I hope you'll have me back because you are the change agent. So please, are there other questions? Um, yes, my name is Hazel Makai. Yes. Yes. I am a second year student here. OK. Um, and as a 2L, we are constantly, well, me Yes. Right. So my question is, what do you do in those moments to remind yourself of that greater purpose? Or what do you do in those hard moments where you're getting kicked in the face? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So let me answer the question by saying this. When I was at 2L at Northwestern, it was in 1998, there was 100% job placement because the economy was booming. I went on 65, it, 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 the way it worked at my school was any law school that came to my school to interview, if they wanted to do on campus and you wanted to interview them, they had to interview you. That was the rule. So if they came on campus, they couldn't decide who they wanted to interview before they got there. If they wanted to have on-campus interviewing, any law student that wanted to interview with like Sidley or Kirkland or whoever was there, the rule was they had to do an interview with you. And they could not ask for transcripts prior to the interview on campus. I went on 60, now I knew I was going to go back and do public service. I knew that's what I was going to do. But I wanted to go through the process that I could have an appreciation or an understanding for what disabled people face when they go through interviews such as this. I interviewed with 65 law firms at Northwestern. Of the 65 that I interviewed, how many do you think, I'm not talking about offers, I'm talking about callbacks. How many callbacks do you think I got when I went on 65 interviews at, at Northwestern? Just guess. How many callbacks do you think I got? Three. 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 Remember, let's remember, it's 1998. And it was 100% job placement out of Northwestern. How many callbacks? Did you say three, five, one? Whoever said zero was correct. I didn't get a single callback from a single law firm. Now, I, I was OK with that because I knew I was going to do public service. But I wanted to see what the experience would be like so I could have a better appreciation or understanding of it. And I went to career services and I said, why did this happen? Why did I get no callbacks? And career services basically you know, told me, look, it's just easier to hire other people. You know, you're blind. It's just the way life is. If they want to hire you, it's a lot more work for them. And so as a result, they just move on to the next. And I think at the end of the day, you, know, you just have to realize that, OK, so I wasn't meant to do that. I wasn't meant to go in that direction. And that maybe that gave me a better understanding and a better appreciation for the people that do have to go through that and do have to experience that and do have to go and, and do that. I mean, ultimately, life is about experiences. The more experience you have, the better an attorney you're going to be. It's just that simple. The better you're going to be if you have personal experience. No matter how hard or difficult or challenging they are, the more difficult or the more challenging they are, the better your experiences are going to be, the better off you're going to be, the better you're going to be able to represent and understand and appreciate your clients, the better it's going to make you. That's the blessing of it. I don't think I would be as good a judge if I hadn't gone through this. I don't think I'd be as good a judge if I didn't spend 10 weeks in a hospital. I don't think I would be as good a judge if I hadn't had to fight every day to stay in school. I don't think I'd be as good a judge if I haven't had to face the things I had to go through. Because you're compassionate. You're understanding. You're able to relate to people. You're able to appreciate people. You're able to work with people. And you're able to connect with people in a more profound way. Other questions? Hi. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. It was a tough race. It was my first year. And the question I have is, when you um, started your law school journey, did you ever experience a lack of support from your parents or family members or anything like that? Did you ever experience any of that when you were going through that? It's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful question. I was very blessed because I came from you know, a very supportive background and a, and a very supportive place. And I think that's an absolutely critical thing. And I always knew I was going to be a lawyer. And I was blessed to have those opportunities and blessed to have those experiences. You know, I was, that, I was you know, blessed to have that. Um, but I think, though, that, you know, what, you know, I think that the biggest, I'm just going to tell you what I think the biggest challenge to civil rights in terms of young attorneys and having more attorneys who do this kind of work is the LSAT. I think that the LSAT, I think, is by far one of the greatest encumbrances 
to our future justice system, our future attorneys, and our future civil rights. A, B, C, D, E, and F go into a restaurant. If A, if A is seated next to C, and B is seated next to D, where is A in relation to E and F? Now, I just made that up, but here's the thing. Here's, but here's the thing. If you look at the LSAT, it actually says that you are required to diagram in the space provided. It actually says it. There's a space. It says, in the space provided, you're required to do it to draw a diagram in order to answer the question. So the challenge with the LSAT and why it is so incredibly problematic is because it is blatantly discriminatory. And the reason for that is, even if you give the exam in Braille, even if you give the exam on tape, even if I had eight years to take the exam, it wouldn't matter because it's a visual bias. How do you ask a blind person to draw a picture or do a diagram? You can't do it. And so what happens is, is, is that so many people with disabilities, especially blindness, self-select out of law school. Because if they weren't from a family of lawyers, you'd sit down and take this exam and you would say, well, I can't do this. And if this is what is required of me when I go to law school, I don't really have a chance to do well in school. I don't have a chance to make it. I'm not going to be able to succeed. So I guess I just shouldn't bother. And I have to be honest with you. It's a really big issue. And it's a sad issue. I was at Harvard speaking to them on this very same topic because it's such a huge issue to the disabled community. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say it out loud. I think the American Bar Association has done our profession a great injustice. I'm gonna explain to you why. The ABA is good for two, well, for one really, they're good for two great things. <laughs> the American Bar Association, and I, that's why I'm a member, is fantastic. <laughs> They get you the greatest hotel discounts that you will ever come across. So if you're looking for a really great hotel discount, your ABA membership gets a great discount. And they do give car rentals, which you know I really don't get to benefit from, but they do give great car rental ships. Outside of that, they are very, very ineffective. And the reason that I have such an issue with the ABA, in fact, we, I had to back off this case, which was really hard for me because now I'm a judge, I couldn't do it, so I had to leave the case. But I just want to tell you what the problem with the ABA was. I went to Northwestern, and I sat down for Stanley Kaplan. I know I'm going on for a while, but I think this is an important issue because I, I really get passionate about it. So I, I, went to, uh, I went to take Stanley Kaplan, like all of you guys I'm sure did, and I couldn't do it. I literally just couldn't do it. I just could not do it. And so I remember law services, I applied for accommodations and all this kind of stuff. And in every big organization that you deal with, there's always an honest person. There's always a good person that works there that does an honest thing. And a gentleman by the name of Tom Ruck, who was like a test administrator for LSAC, sent me a letter. And I said, you know, I'm applying. The LSAT is just difficult for me. You know, I, I can't figure out why I can't do this and this and that. And so he sent a letter. And, and, and basically, like, you know, I was asking for all these accommodations. And he sent a letter. And he said, look, you know, we would suggest as a test administrator that you ask for an LSAT, that you get a waiver to the LSAT because, because of your disability and because of the requirements of accommodations you would need and because of all these various issues, this is not going to be a predictive exam for you. I mean, well, it makes sense. You have to draw a picture. I mean, it's not like we're talking about rocket science. So then what happened, though, was so I, I went to Northwestern and I said, look, you know, law services sent me this letter. And they said that this would not be a predictive exam. And let's, if we could do a different admissions process. So what Northwestern did was a wonderful dean. They said, well, let's, OK. They said, so here's what we're going to do. You know, instead of submitting us three letters of reference, we want 10 letters of reference. So I gave them 10 letters. And they had to be from, like, 
people, not the people who knew you, but people like professors that you took their class, that they could talk about your, they, it had to be like career oriented type letters that talked about your skill set and your ability to do the task at hand. So we, we did that. I gave them more writing samples than was required. I did all, you know, I did all of that. And then I got admitted to Northwestern. Now, the Law School Admissions Council found out about this. And I have no problem using names. I just think it's totally appropriate because people should be held accountable for what they do. So and I have no problem with it. I just don't have any, I don't have, I really don't have any issues. So there's a lady by the name of Joan Van Toll who works, Joan, and her last name is Van Toll. I just want to be very clear. I just want to make sure that you know the name and it's not Van Toll. First name, Joan Van Toll. She's general counsel, and I have no problem saying this. Uh, no problem, because it's, this is, I think people should be called out for their behavior. And so she was the attorney for the Law School Admissions Council, and she really embarked on what could only be described as a very unethical path. And, and, and I, I wish, I'm hoping that she'll sue me one day, because I would really, really love it if she did. I would really love it. I'm hoping that she would. But, but you know, she can't because she knows it. She actually taught like a, a class, if you, if you look at it, it was a class and it was actually titled How to Deny Accommodations on the LSAT. Like that was a seminar that was actually titled How to Deny Accommodations on the LSAT. And so basically, and I just want to say one quick thing about the LSAT. So the Law School Admissions Council, which administers the LSAT, okay, has been sued twice by the United States Department of Justice. As you guys remember, when you went through your application process, do you remember you had to probably submit everything to LSAC, and then LSAC submits to the law school? So their website was inaccessible for blind users, and they absolutely refused to make their website accessible. They just, they just wouldn't do it. The US Department of Justice had to be brought in to force them to simply make their website accessible. That's outrageous. The second thing is, they got sued again by the Department of Justice because they would not provide reasonable accommodations to people with disabilities, and the Department of Justice had to yet again intervene on behalf of this matter to make sure that people with disabilities were offered reasonable accommodations. I mean, just craziness. But what happened was that, that the Law School Admissions Council, the ABA has one power, it was granted its power by the United States Department of Education. They were granted the power to accredit law schools. So the, I don't know why they were given this, but the Department of Education gave it to the American Bar Association, and the ABA can accredit schools. So what Joan Van Toll did was, after I got admitted to Northwestern, the Law School Admissions Council was so infuriated about this that somebody would go to law school without taking the LSAT and work around their monopoly and work around their system. They were so infuriated by it and so threatened by it that they went to the American Bar Association that has a financial relationship with them and basically passed Section 503. What Section 503 says that if any law school were to ever waive the LSAT requirement, such as Northwestern, they would immediately be stripped of their accreditation by the American Bar Association so as to preserve and protect their monopoly. And so basically, I was waiting because I couldn't do anything about it. And Northwestern told me, they said, we're very saddened by this because we want to be more diverse. We want to have more disabled people. We want to do all these kinds of things. But look, as you guys know, what governs a law school? A law school's priorities are always going to be governed by US News and World Report. Everyone can argue about it and say different, but we know that's the case. If US News and Report, if you fall in the rankings, you know that your donors are going to get mad, you know that your alumnus are going to get mad, you know everyone's going to get mad, it's a whole big thing. So what's going to happen is that for the deans, they just say, look, if a blind person takes the exam, even though it's unfair, just we don't want him here because it's going to lower the, the mean LSAT. So basically what happened was that we had to, I sued the American Bar Association. And the ABA's defense, which I thought was incredible, the ABA's defense was, even though we require the exam for accommodation, we do not offer the exam. So even though we require it for a law school's accommodation, we are not the offerers. And since we are not the offerers, we can't be held subject to whether or not the exam meets the ADA requirement. Because the LSAT is not is a violation of the ADA, because you have to draw pictures and diagrams. There's no question about that. The issue is they were arguing that since we don't offer it, you can't hold us responsible for it even though we require it. 
It was just craziness. So anyways, I'm off that case, unfortunately. But my hope is that law schools will gather together and rise up and tell the ABA, look, we're tired of you being telling us what to do. We're tired of Joan Van Toll and the Law School Admissions <laughs> Council telling us what we can do and we can't. If we want to use the LSAT, we can use the LSAT. If we want to waive the LSAT because we have a disabled person, a blind person who can't draw pictures and diagrams, that discretion should be up to us if we want to waive the exam and not be penalized for it because we want to have a more diverse environment and drawing pictures and diagrams should not require us to lower our mean score. And yet, you know, that's a threat to the LSAC. And unfortunately, because of their relationship with the ABA, then that's what's going to happen. I actually went to a conference in San Francisco held by the ABA, and I actually told them what I thought of them. And <laughs> I haven't been invited to any other conferences. <laughs> but I'm just enjoying. Are there other questions? You know what? I, we have to um, let our students go to class. Okay. I'm going to I'm gonna wrap up with one last thing to get you inspired. And then we can talk after if you want, um, personally. But a, a, there's a story of a pessimist and an optimist who once met on the street. And the pessimist said, why is the world such a harsh and challenging and difficult place? To which the optimist said, I've always believed that the world is what we choose to make it. This is your opportunity. This is your school. This is your experience. This is your world. By coming here, by being a part of it, by going to this school, by joining this profession, you have decided what kind of a world you want this to be. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.